Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Sadly, this is the last energy seminar for this academic year. We will re resume activities on September 26th at, in Falkwater. Uh, we have a real treat today. We have our first speaker who actually has come from outside our hemisphere since COVID started. Uh, Chris Boringer uh, started his career uh, with a degree in industrial engineering at the Technical University of Karlsruhe and interestingly then got a doctorate in economics at the University of Stuttgart. He kind of made a meteorocic uh, rise through the environmental engineering and economics community in Europe. And uh, now I would say is one of the best known ener energy transition technical economist in, in certainly Germany, probably in Europe and most likely the rest of the uh, Best of the world uh, as well, uh, which leads him to his current position uh, as a professor of economic policy at Lisiewski University in Oldenburg, uh, Germany, and he's going to talk to us today about a major study that he helped run and participated in on climate policy after Paris uh, pledge trade and recycle. Uh, conveniently, given the timing refocusing uh, the attention on equity, both internationally and uh, domestically, but within a e kind of standard uh, uh, eco economic equilibrium modeling framework in which Chris is one of the leading uh, practitioners with several colleagues, I might add, around the world. So Chris, take it away. John, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. And uh, as John pointed out, I'm going to present a short summary on a more recent energy modeling forum study. I assume here in this room you are not allowed to go in if you don't know what the energy modeling forum is. So I will not stay with that. Um, that modeling study deals with the issue on um, emissions pricing or carbon pricing post Paris, meaning after the Paris Agreement. And um, just to give some credits uh, beyond the the support by John and his staff. We had financial support by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And meanwhile, all the results have been summarized in a special issue in energy economics where John, together with Richard Toll, is an editor. And uh, so all the slides, meaning all the tables of figures that you are going to see, not too many um, can be found in that paper unless I have mentioned a different source. So you can read things uh, and look things up and check. So given the limited time, I think 40 minutes roughly for presentation and then uh, 10 or 15 minutes for discussion, I focus myself on two blocks. One is an introduction to the broader issue. There, yeah, I was not so uh, clear whether you are trained too much in economics uh, or more to the engineering side. So I was cautious for you are more on the engineering side. So I, I will raise some principles uh, of economics that make climate policy a real challenge. And then I also summarize right away the key insights, the two messages of the study. Before, in the second point of block, I go in the study design and uh, discuss in more detail the results. So climate policy theory and practice, uh, a short primer maybe. If you come from a narrow economic perspective, it seems st standard how to address the problem um, of consulting policymakers, what to do about climate change, what would be an optimal emission reduction path, including what would be the temperature that we should go for. Uh, the principal idea is at the margin you trade off the efforts of emission abatement, the cost of emission abatement against the benefit of emission abatement and that would be the avoided climate damage. So this is the, in a nutshell, this is neoclassical marginal cost-benefit analysis <clears throat> and I think all of you are familiar with that in the context of optimization uh, in various contexts. So cost-benefit analysis applied to <coughs> climate change typically takes place in integrated assessment. John had a couple of really nice review papers on that. I think one in 2014, the last one I saw was 2018. 
discussing the limitations but also the strengths of these models. And uh, maybe you know the seminal reference to integrate assessment is uh, towards the colleague Bill Nordhaus at Yale, the DICE model, fundamentally for the concept of such a model, he was rewarded the Nobel Prize. So in a nutshell, an integrated assessment model combines uh, concepts of economics, uh, see economic growth uh, with natural science, translates um, economic activity into emissions, emissions into changes of the climate, meaning concentration changes and then temperature changes, these feedback via climate damages and affect economic growth. And you do that in a circle, then you get an integrated assessment model. And in this context, <coughs> you can trade off the cost and the benefits at the margin of doing more abatement. If we look then at the insights of such addition of dyes, then what you see here to the left and other side is what would be an optimal emission path. And you see we start at 40 gigatons of CO2 in 2015. That's our global industrial CO2 emissions, more or less. And then we still have some rise, maybe until COVID 2020. And then you see from that onwards, the model calculates what would be the emission reduction path because we go in the future. So it's intertemporal optimization. And it would basically uh, tell you what is at the margin uh, the best thing to do and give you the emission reduction path. You see here three lines. The black line would be what Nordhaus's model with his discount rate uh, would suggest. So there is a big debate on the right discount rate. As you may know, if a climate damage occurs in the future, it matters a lot with what discount rate you The damage translates more or less one-to-one -one in present value. And if it's high, then some damage in the future, you would not care. So the higher the discount rate, the more you would actually go um, with emissions and less abatement. So that was the black line by Nordhaus. And there was a debate what's the right discount rate. Green and blue are now export polls that lower that. Um, I think that's not so important now in our context, it all shows that from an optimal perspective, you have to go down. And then that leads you to optimal temp temperature um, targets by the end of a century of two degrees or 1.8 or 1.5. At the moment, the whole debate is about, do we reach 1.5? Um, then Nordhaus was given the, the Nobel Prize I think there was some unease with the integrated assessment community, at least with some people. Um, because in his initial runs, he suggested optimal is 3.4 degrees, right? And, uh, you know, if I tell that my kids, they say, well, then we are all dead and, and burned or whatever. And so what I do now here, what I present now here is an update of the DICE model, which was published in Nature Climate Change by folks from the Potsdam Climate Institute. I don't, I don't now, I can't really judge whether they are better <laughs> or worse in terms of damage evaluation because the big difference between the, the, the black line and the green line, um, meaning the black line, sorry, the black line that leads to two degrees in North was update and the 3.4 that he used for the Nobel Prize talk is he fundamentally has a lower damage function. So it's clear damage functions play a big role. The higher the damage, the more you will abate and then the discount rate. But beyond this discussion, what you see is <clears throat> if we now confront theory from an optimal control perspective with what's the policy practice, I just <clears throat> snapshot yesterday the, what you call the climate tracker or something like that, climate action tracker, still from November 2021, on if we add up the pledges of the world community of different countries around the world made under the Paris Agreement, um, and when we make some assumption on, you know, maybe there are conditional targets, um, and uh, you could be more optimistic or less optimistic, when you get this range of outcomes, this is all like, it's not arbitrary, but it's based on, on arguable assumptions, but let it take like this. I think the message here is we are 
We are far off from, say, 1.5. And it's especially in the short run, if you think about 2030, which is one milestone of the Paris Agreement, we fall short by a substantial gap of what is recommended from an optimal cost-benefit analysis uh, recommendation towards what people are doing. And we can go to the next. Sorry, I'm a little bit out of breath because I'm normally not used to use my... <laughs> um, so the question is, uh, you know, how could we explain? So if somebody, if we believed in economics, um, let it be like this for the time being, um, and somebody tells us you should abate more, temperature should go down more than just to 3.4 degrees, why wouldn't we do that? Um, and the, the, the principles in economics that has been detected to explain that irrational gap between what is optimal and what is real is called free riding. And this is fundamentally the issue that the models that I talked about are run from a social planner perspective, which optimizes above or over the whole globe, whereas in reality we have different agents that play Nash. So do the best in their own interest, and then we have a free rider incentive, which may lead to something which you call the tragedy of the commons. So although it would be good that we really scale back emissions, <coughs> anybody has an incentive not to do it, to free ride on abatement of others without incurring costs themselves. So this free riding problem is is very strong in climate because typically take Germany, even you can take the US, you know, whether you do something or not will not affect the, long, the climate too much in the long run. Um, so the free incentive is very, very big uh, because the difference between the social optimum and what is the Nash optimum typically is, is quite, quite big. So this free riding problem um, could occur within a generation, uh, but it is multiplied or magnified in the climate context through climate dynamics, uh, which makes this climate policy challenge even worse. It takes very, very long time if you obey today that this emission abatement in the stock of emissions basically trends. Climate is, is hundreds of years and not tens of years. And so what I, what I show you here is a little example from Merge, which is a, is a successive model of some professor here, Alan Mann, years ago, Eta Macro, together with Richard Chichels. They built this uh, integrated assessment model, I would say similar to DICE, a little bit more technology rich because they are from Stanford and are more about you know, does energy matter, does party play matter, and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, uh, whether it's dice or merge, you would typically get a profile on the net benefits of abatement, which looks like this. So if you take the boxes, you see the net benefit by decade of emission, discounted in net present value, meaning with this example that starts in 2010. So think 10 years back. then uh, you see that it takes a couple of decades until the net benefit within the decade is even positive. If you, if you do the integral, then you get the line, so this would be the cumulative net benefits. So with the cumulative net benefits, it even takes much longer before you break even. So 2017 in this case. And then another thing is that if you look at the distribution Most of the benefits are shifted or, or occur in the future. And that has simply to do with climate dynamics. So this is nothing about economics, but it means that climate investment take a very, very long breath. And if the discount rate is low, then you know it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big challenge to actually justify rapid decarbonization today. So to some extent, I think what policymakers are then faced to is, okay, they can take the, the recommendations by people like John or Bill Nordhaus and say, well, okay, we should abate 1.5 and 2 degrees. 
And in fact, they do it because everybody talks, it's maybe cheap talk about 1.5 and 2 degrees. But I think in, in actual, in contemporary policy making, they are just faced with the old same story, which is burden sharing. How much cost can we shoulder to be re-elected next year on three years or four years? Um, and this, you know, this burden sharing issue dominated, I think, all the time, going back to Kyoto, where at some point uh, the U.S. backed out and said, well, you know, this, it doesn't make sense that we go ahead if China is not in the boat and so on and so forth. The Bert Hegel's resolution at that time. And we see it again now in the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, as you may recall, is a bottom-up contract where people, I would say, under pressure of the world community, came together, policymakers, and then they said, we have to show something, at least. We have to show that, uh, you know, okay, um, maybe cheap talk, we want to reduce emissions, so two degree is something which is suggested by integrated assessment, so let's celebrate. But then we also have to put some flesh inside. But the flesh, as we have seen, they put inside is way below what is needed. So in that context, uh, I want to motivate the EF study because uh, it's all about how can we increase the current pledges uh, within the, for the next round. And the next round would be 2023 or five years later, 2028. So how can we make countries uh, in, the, in, the, in the face of burden sharing, do more than they actually committed to. That's the key challenge of how to increase the ambition of NDC's national determined contributions without losing policy support. So that brings me, I think, to the second part of the talk. Now I have, okay, I, I only, if for people, if some people want to leave already, I give you the summary of results already here. So, you know, you also you have to get somehow a, a catchy title, so we called this, uh, the, the summary or the, the, the study title is then pledge. So we have to increase these pledges, trade and recycle. And the idea here is that trade will allow you to raise cost savings, as I will explain in a second. These cost savings can be used to increase your pledges. And we will see that this, based on numbers we calculate, Splatches can be ramped up quite considerably, so to basically fill that gap that we saw before. And then there is still the issue about burden sharing within societies. So what's about the poor person who can't afford uh, any longer electricity and then has to use the candle, right? I wanted to introduce actually a, uh, a little picture from uh, Edison where he at some point said, listen, we will make electricity so cheap that only the poor people, uh, only the rich people can actually afford candles. But as you had seen before, it's just the other way around me, right? And with the petrol prices, you see again the challenge that we are facing with higher energy prices. So the idea then is, um, first, um, how to actually, without, without overcharging, uh, the willingness to pay of countries in the international climate debate, how to raise the pledges. And the simple answer is, if there is scope for saving cost in emission abatement, you could take this cost savings and, and thinking that the initial pledges had been the willingness to pay of the countries, and if uh, there is no extra cost now to ramping up pledges because you just use efficiency gains from trading, then at least I think this is a natural way to say, well, let's do it. Uh, there is no means to actually burden the country, its country with more, um, with more cost than before. And that's simply, I don't I go too much into, inside this uh, uh, graph on the right hand other side. This is simply a textbook graph where we see uh, marginal abatement cost curves. So what costs at the margin to reduce emissions for country A or for country B, you see these convex curves. <coughs> And by optimization, it's clear that you trade off. Uh, there's no arbitrage, more or less. So um, abatement costs between the two countries should be equalized. That's at the intersect. And if you have different pledges that lead to different points on the mark curves, and there is no balancing mechanism like an emissions trading, you basically have additional costs 
which are the, the red line, a red area and the blue area. And for, for reducing this cost or reaping efficiency gains through cooperation, you would suggest emissions trading. That's a very, very old story. And I think, John, you did that quite a bit in the EMF 16 study back to Kyoto, 1999 or 2001. So that's the one idea. What we, what we basically show in the study is across models, across simulation uh, analysis, that the cost savings from carbon trading in the actual Paris context is big enough to pay for a two degree compatible pledge. So actually to close the gap that we have seen before in the, in the slide a couple of minutes ago. The other issue is about, well, how can we go about uh, the problem that if we raise energy prices and we realize that low-income people have a higher expenditure share on energy, that these are hit more than the rich people. So you call this effect that lower people are burdened more than richer, you call this a regressive effect. And uh, it just show you some numbers from a German income expenditure survey where you see across household details, age 1 to age 10, where the poorest household actually spends, say, 20% of income on transport, heating, and electricity, whereas the richest just 10%. Right? So that means a carbon tax, a carbon price which increases oil, coal, and gas that is used for providing transport, heating, and electricity services will typically be regressive. The good news is that with a carbon pricing, you get rents. You make something shorter, you put a shadow price on it, so in economic terms that gives you rents. The government can collect these rents and it can recycle the rents. <coughs> and the crucial question now is how to recycle the rents. So the, 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 the more or less new idea now is to say, <laughs> um, we take the rents and we recycle it on an equal share per, per household. And that means if John is much richer than me, which I assume, of course, uh, you know, and we get 500 bucks, him and me, then the 500 bucks for me will be much more in relative terms than for him. So this be, means this is a progressive effect, right? Uh, so it, it, it basically punishes the rich and helps the poor. And if you simply apply this little story or mechanism in terms of we raise energy prices, we do a little input-output calculation, so the I.O. is now input-output calculation, when we see how you are, you are hit on the expenditure side with higher prices, but when you get back the equal per capita bonus, like three, four hundred bucks, then you see that the regressive impact can be offset by the progressive um, income effect or recycling effect. And these two ideas, these carry through the whole study and uh, show that this applies to most of the countries. And so these are the two key messages of the study. So now I'm back to say more of the technical details of the energy modeling forum study. You, um, as I said, you may be acquainted with uh, the overall idea and design of this study. Basically, it's about the modeling puzzle. So you are policy makers. All of you run a model, say 40 models, and everybody comes up with a different number. If the numbers are very tight and very close together, you would say, okay. Um, but if they even have differences in sign, you are puzzled. And so this, of course, is not good for the modeling profession. Uh, and uh, it doesn't mean good in terms of making money. It means in terms of providing advice and intellectually, intellectual value added. And that was basically, I think, the idea of the Energy Modeling Study Forum years ago um, to say, well, how could, we, uh, how could we solve this problem or relax it? Well, we establish for certain policy questions uh, every so often, we establish groups of modelers around the world which share similar assumptions on data. So you streamline part of the study, uh, but then you give a certain leeway 
that every group can control, but it's still not too much, so you can't cost compare. So the idea is when at the end of the day you come together, you have some solid common foundations, but then you can say, well, why are you getting the double of the price? Or why are you a negative sign? And so on and so forth. And then you discuss and you basically may remodel. Um, and the idea then is to come up with robust policy recommendations, in short. So again, this is basically the background of this study, where we said, well, we want first to do an impact assessment of what it means if countries implement their nationally determined contributions, meaning their regional emission reduction targets by 2030. This has been done by lots of people. Now it's done in a coordinated exercise. And then we have these two key issues in mind. How can we ripe up the pledge? How can we, how can we uh, uh, make it bigger, magnify it? And there we think about emissions trading, which is an old story, but we basically put it in a, in a real policy context here. And then the issue is about the household incidence of CO2 pricing. And we had in this analysis, we had 17 modeling groups which share scenario assumptions. I will mention them in a second. They have harmonized input data. You know, there are some databases which are shared and, and global, like the GTAP database, Global Trade Analysis Project in Purdue. Then, of course, because we think of the future, we are now 2022, and uh, we need to think about 2030. So one issue is what is the baseline? What, what does the world look like in 2030? Of course, it's arbitrary, but you have to base some assumptions here, make some assumptions, and we use then, for example, here, we do sensitivity analysis, but the main results I present now are projections by the International Energy Outlook on baseline emissions in the different countries and GDP growth up to 2030. And then, of course, at the end, people have to streamline the results. You know, it's, it's, it sounds a little bit uh, trivial, but boy, if you are in the uh, coordinator and somebody gives you the results in an Excel sheet and, uh, and uh, number one in the CSV text file, and they are not using the same labels, this kills you. Given that, you know, one, one really great achievement of EMF is to have international and global coverage for many studies. So here, uh, you know, here Uh, we have a couple of, it's a little bit Eurocentric here, <laughs> a couple of European countries. But I think if you have a global exercise where modeling groups from different countries participate, that's a strong policy sign as well if they come up with a, with a meaningful and robust insight. Okay, so we can go to the next. Um, so this is a flow chart of the basic workhorse. Um, you know, I didn't show a, a flowchart of integrated assessment model, but that part would, could be part of an integrated assessment model if it only focused on economics. And what you see here is more or less a visualization of an input-output table and the bilateral trade matrices. Um, and these are simply put in formulas where you say, depending on relative prices, people produce more from one good or the other good, they take more input from the one thing or the other thing, they trade more, and so on and so forth. So fundamentally, you have, um, you think about how much of a commodity I in region R should I produce, so you have different sectors. That's the input-output matrix, that's the first quadrant, that's the input, intermediate flows between, um, say, the steel industry, the milk industry, and so on and so forth in US. And for producing, you need primary factor inputs, which may be labor and capital, shaded, and you also need intermediate inputs. So I think I, I could use this guy. So here you produce, you take um, factory inputs, and what you produce, John, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. And uh, as John pointed out, I'm going to present a short summary on a more recent energy modeling forum study. I assume here in this room you are not allowed to go in if you don't know what the energy modeling forum is. So I will not stay with that. Um, that modeling study deals with the issue on um, emissions pricing or carbon pricing post-2030. 
Paris, meaning after the Paris Agreement. And um, just to give some credits uh, beyond the, the support by John and his staff, we had financial support by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And meanwhile, all the results have been summarized in a special issue in energy economics where John, together with Richard Toll, is an editor. And uh, so all the slides, meaning all the tables of figures that you are going to see, not too many um, can be found in that paper unless I have mentioned a different source. So you can read things uh, and look things up and check. So given the limited time, I think 40 minutes roughly for presentation and then uh, 10 or 15 minutes for use, you basically combine with what you get from imports from other regions to a, a mixed good, which in, in fact you then reuse as an intermediate input or you basically consume. And how much you consume depends on your income. So this is an income closure, so you get income from labor and capital and you spend it on consumption. There could be a government agent with taxes and so on and so forth. And then, of course, apart from domestic relationship, you also export to other regions and you import. So this is more or less, if you take such a model, you take a multi-region, multi-sector CGE model, you basically have a snapshot of the international world uh, that you... All of the models, maybe this is a weak side of the project, I'm not sure, all of the models share this structure. Um, so they are relatively uniform. Um, within this modeling paradigm, there are different ways how you could represent trade. If somebody is more interested in trade, you have the trade theory, you have the new trade theory, you have the new new trade theory, uh, and all of them become or claim that they are better in explaining what's going on. And uh, these models could basically reflect different trade paradigms. But again, they share like a common mainstream perspective here. So that later on will not really explain the variation in results. It's mostly still data and assumption driven in terms of elasticities. So what is the, why is this uh, type of model so popular? Well, on the one hand, it can cover this, um, this aspects of international competitiveness because you talk about multiple regions, multiple sectors that are engaged in domestic production, consumption and trade. Then I think a really plus point against like macroeconometric models is that they are very much rooted in, in microeconomics. So you can do very consistent uh, welfare analysis. Therefore, I call my classes, if I do something like computational economics, I call it theory with numbers. So to, to some extent, you take theory uh, and then you put numbers to it and you produce numbers out of it. Uh, another aspect is that you have, it's, uh, why is it called general? Because it has not a narrow view on, on one single market uh, or basically just looks on the expenditure side of a household. No, it has the whole cycle of how is revenue created and how is uh, income spent. Uh, for example, if you think about incidence analysis in many fields, taxation, um, you use micro simulation models and they very often only focus on the expenditure effect. So how are different households affected with different taxes? But of course, the taxes will affect the, in the capital markets, in the labor markets, and so on the income side, you may actually also be very much affected by these changes and that would be something which you capture here. So fundamentally, what these models then do is we have an instrument, and in our case, that will be an emission budget. The emission budget will be cur curtailed because you have to, to make up with your pledges. That, in a technical term, rises up the shadow price, which is the carbon price, and the carbon price makes all things more expensive that are using carbon. You have structural adjustment because all these activities are price responsive in supply and demand. Okay, so um, I go quickly through that. So I told about streamlining assumptions. So we focus on certain regions and certain sectors. And uh, we don't need that now. <laughs> um, and then I think uh, before I go in the last three or four slides with, uh, with the results, uh, it's important that you understand the scenario dimensions. Um, so we 
limited the scenario dimensions basically to two aspects. One is the ambition level. So that would be what we call the NDC. And our reference would be the NDC as they are made under the, under the Paris Agreement. So how much the US pledged, whatever, 25% as compared to 1990, the EU pledged 40%, Russia played, pledged zero or 5%. So um, this is basically where we have a handshake with reality, I would call it like that. When the NDC plus are also written down commitments by countries that say, well, if the US does 5% more, we do 1% more. So this is conditional, so therefore we call it NDC+. Plus. That's already mentioned in all the communications between the national governments and the authorities under the Paris Agreement, whoever coordinates all this. And then what we have as the final one is construed, this is the NDC2 decree, so that would be is necessary at the global level to fill the gap that we have seen before between the initial gap, uh, between the initial pledge and the pledge which is necessary to reach the two-degree temperature target. Okay? And fundamentally, it means in NDC, as we will see, uh, you reduce carbon emissions in 2030 by 10%, but if you really want to reach two degrees, you should already reduce it by at least 20%. And then for playing this card on efficiency gains or cost savings from emission strength, we do two polar cases. One would be uh, the reference case where countries just implement a domestic carbon system, meaning a carbon emission price, a tax, or a national emissions trading system, but there is no bilateral emissions trading with China or the Europe or between these, these countries that I mentioned. And uh, the, other, uh, the other polar case would be global, and there you know, maybe this is a very ambitious assumption. We say we, are, we have emissions trading all over. That's even not the case now in the EU, EU ETS, but the EU ETS will be enlarged, and uh, in, I think in a few years we will have this, this uh, emissions trading across all regions and sectors within the EU at least. Um, okay, and what I present now are, I think, two or three, three figures um, on results that echo the basic findings and what you see in terms of results are percentage changes in, say, real consumption or welfare, um, emissions, income, as compared to a reference situation which is a business as usual in 2030. Right? Meaning, what we don't do in this study is to account for the benefits of emission abatement. So typically, if you reduce something which you like, like driving your Ferrari or something like that, you will actually lose consumer surplus. Um, if you have to produce with higher input costs because you have to pay more for coal, gas, and oil, then you lose producer surplus. And so it's not surprising that in these studies, we always talk about cost adjustment cost. But we should not forget we all do that because we have this overarching guideline from integrate assessment. Yeah, yeah, you should reduce because in the long run there are benefits, um, net benefits um, from emission abatement. Okay. So this looks a little bit uh, sizzling or confusing, but I therefore focus on all, which, which, which would be the emission reduction across all countries if we add up the pledges. So this is no simulation run at this point. It's simply taking the input data on the BAU, applying the pledges, and then say how much emission reduction does this country-specific pledges, how much do they involve at the global level as compared to an international energy outlook business as usual. And you see the blue bar is what we have is a pledge under Paris, so that would be roughly 10%. You see that the NDC plus with conditional stuff at the moment does not matter a lot. It's just from 10 to 12%, but what would matter is to be two degree consistent, and then we go up to 20%. So therefore, later on, you know, the NDC, sorry, the NDC and NDC plus results are very, very close together. Okay? Um, what you also see is that there are substantial differences in NDCs. And uh, however you can interpret them, my interpretation is you could take these as a willingness to pay at the point being of these countries. So um, 
maybe Korea did not think about too much. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and the Russians had been much smarter. But, you know, it looks like the Korean had initially a very, very, they have a very, very high emission reduction pledge, which they gave to, to, um, to Paris, for whatever reason. Because if I go in my model and I run a simulation for Korea, it's not that they can easily abate. They have relatively uh, steep abatement cost curves, so that means that they get relatively high CO2 prices, but that would be maybe an indication if they, if they say we do it for their voluntary contribution to save the climate. Um, and uh, at the same time, you see that Russia has very, very low willingness, uh, very little reduction targets. The, the brown addition, what they add in terms of additional conditional pledges in the green one actually is construed in the way that the scale emission reduction pledges in emission levels, so they proportionally across regions, so we end up to get the two degree consistent overall target. Okay, so I think this is to be kept in mind, 10% of NDC versus 20% in NDC two degrees. So two slides. So, um, so what you see here is what I call the global welfare effect um, so this is the aggregated consumption loss, because it's negative, across all regions in the model. And we have different models. So, uh, you know, for each model, we get different results. And you see there is a considerable spread. Uh, of all, these, all these models use similar uh, data to start with. They have a relatively logically coherent setting. Um, so you could ask why are we so different and uh, we can maybe discuss that later on, but the main drivers here are differences in assumptions on price elasticities. Um, you know, short run price elasticities, long run price elasticities, and so on and so forth. But I picked now the model that I run, so University of Oldenburg, and what is the key insight? And this key insight actually applies to all models independent of how big these bars are. So. The insight is the following. You see that the darker shaded bars are the welfare losses under global, and the lighter shaded bars are those under REF. Remember, REF was, I basically do emission reduction at the national level only without emissions trading, and global was, I involve myself in global emissions trading. So what you see is that, that the, the shaded bars are always smaller than the light bars, which means we have these cost savings through, we have these cost savings through uh, emissions trading. So if we now look at NDC, and we say we want to go from NDC to NDC 2 degree, so that would basically mean that we go here from the blue to the green bar, then if we use REF, it's a little bit more, maybe here it's tripling, but it's more than doubles the cost, okay? Um, so, as, as expected, we have to abate more, we get more, uh, probably overproportional if it's convex uh, um, adjustment cost. But what you also see if you, take the, if you take the blue bar, that is basically now we have an NDC uh, achieved uh, in, without emissions trading, and you compare it with an NDC to decrease with a dark green bar, then these two numbers are comparable. And the NDC two degree green bar means we have a much higher emission reduction target, which we achieve through emissions trading. So these are numbers I mean. You could do VSCA blocks uh, that are in the paper. But here, then, you see that we can use the cost savings from carbon trading to pay for, for the two degree compatible NDC pledge. That was the first message. And that's robust across these different models, although the level is somehow different across the models, okay? Then uh, the second message was about um, how are households affected? So different groups then took their national input output data and decomposed it across households in the countries. Um, they decomposed it across the deciles, income deciles, 
uh, with respect to expenditure and income data. So you basically have national uh, accounts that, that you use and combine it with more aggregate data. And then uh, the scenario we call is that, that by selling emissions and making money using the scarcity value, the shadow price uh, gives you rents, then uh, the government in an equal yield way, uh, they recycle that in equal shares to households. Okay? Equal yield means that uh, you know, we still maintain all other governmental um, obligations. So I think Stanford, maybe John's position is more financed through private funds. I'm not sure. I am totally paid by public funds, so they would not fire me here. So they would maintain my job here. Okay, so we go further with the last slide. And uh, so that's now a visco plot. And we, here you see what I tried to indicate initially that <clears throat> we now do across all these models, uh, we do a visco plot where we have uh, the black lines here are the, the, the medians, the, the, the green triangles are the, the, are the means, and then you have a upper and lower quartile, and uh, you have some interquartile range from 0.5 to capture outliers. But what you see is blue, the blue uh, items here capture the expenditure effect. So this is the initial regressive effect of emissions pricing. So it's highest with the poorest household is the incidence is highest and the richer you more or less get, the, 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 the less you basically are affected by the higher energy prices in relative terms. But if we do then the progressive income effect, which is the brown or orange bars here, and we add these together, then we get this line, which is the median across all households. And there you see clearly second message, which is lump sum recycling of carbon rents offsets regressive emissions pricing. Okay? With that, uh, I, come, I think I come to my conclusions already. Uh, before I do that, let me say, if you had been longer in this, um, in this theme of carbon pricing, revenue recycling, and so on and so forth, this will not come as a surprise, what I say. But I think what is really surprising is, uh, I have heard from a double dividend hypothesis. Uh, Lawrence Golder uh, is a colleague uh, of John, who basically uh, kicked off this theme, and the idea is, oh, if we use if we use carbon revenues and we do recycle it smartly by lowering labor taxes or capital taxes, maybe we even do not have to account for any benefits from better environmental quality, but we make the tax system more efficient. So it's about what you would call the marginal cost of public funds will be equalized through a tax reform and that's basically the double dividend. So we may have um, you know, an efficiency gain and a more efficient um, uh, taxation system to raise public revenues. And that was all hype through, throughout the 90s, end of 90s and 2000s. And what was not hype was lump sum. Because lump sum was said, well, if you use it lump sum, you forgo the possibility to reduce some taxes that are very distortionary and that limit economic growth. And that's still around here. So you could think of smarter ways of recycling by saying, I reduce capital taxes. But, you know, then you would need to have this construed argument of an, of an uh, economist saying, well, we have additional instruments to do a, with, a, with, a, with a additional welfare gains. We can do lump sum recycling through the back door. And therefore, now the, the, I would say the cat, the cat's meow is to do uh, lump sum recycling for good reasons. Okay? So we have these two messages uh, which I try to motivate from the get-go. And um, I think um, I put it a little bit as a hypothesis. I think the, the mechanisms are clear. But what the EMF 36 study did is it put some numbers and, and basically tested this hypothesis um, um, confronted, say, with real policy and real data. And then I have my final thank to you. Um, so, uh, I have to, you, John, I think you say modeling for insights, not for numbers. Uh, I would change it a little bit and say backed by numbers because um, 
we know a lot of insights from, theor from theory, but we know whether it's big, the effect is big or not, and how you basically add up effects, as you have seen the income effect and the expenditure effect, you need to have applied analysis. And therefore, I think the, the approach of EMF, basically the modeling forum to basically deal with energy policy issues in a way where you root in sound theory, you are rooted in sound theory, but you, you basically quantify is a very, very helpful one, hopefully still in the future. Um, and with that, I thank you and your staff and you as an audience. Great. Uh, thanks, Chris, for giving a lecture on environmental economics, trade theory, uh, a better overview of EMF than, than I could do, and then the results from this very interesting and timely study. We have time for a couple of questions, probably only in the room here. Um, thank you. First, thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, super, super um, interesting. Uh, so m my question was just about um, where the, the capital for the lump sum recycling is, is, is coming from and whether this requires like a significant expansion in like the actual um, scope of, of, of emissions trading systems. Uh, it seems right now the primary mechanism for um, for uh, for financing a like emissions reduction in let's say in a developing economy is a, um, a firm in a developed economy paying like a direct cash transfer to that firm t to reduce their emissions. And so, doesn't that transfer um, in some way sort of represent like the the efficiency gain that um, that the firm has has like has has uh, done by by doing the uh, emissions reductions in the cheaper area, yeah. and so then if that's the case, then um, like where is the the capital? Where's the saving coming from that would yeah. then allow that lump sum yeah. recycling to, to work? Um, maybe I answer directly. Is that okay? Or should, yeah. So good question. Um, so what you refer to is uh, more project based emissions trading, which could be joint implementation and CDM, which was on walk. 10 years ago, but now it basically, and the answer is if you do that, of course, there is no way that how the government captures the rents and does the re recycling. So this was not considered here. So the way we think here about is that, that there is by law, you have an emission budget and then uh, you can trade uh, nationally and then you have an emission price and, and you get the money or you have a tax. Um, and that allows you in a revenue neutral way to do what, what we described. In your case, um, we, could not, we could not actually, um, if the way how the, the, the impact goes, I think on the expenditure side, it will be still regressive because uh, you know, the one thing that we will see is the savings for, for, for emissions trading uh, as a, you know, a, a firm does not need to increase maybe its uh, emission cost too much because they can trade and say you do it better and so on. So that's the idea of CDMPI. So there is a lower cost, but the regressive impact will be still there through higher energy prices. And so this, this cost savings that I talked about will then show up through um, changes, say, in the income of labor and capital and uh, so that would be a little bit more along the lines that I take the money and make implicit reductions on maybe the capital cost or the labor cost. And I could not say how this, this goes now, but for sure you could not control it like I did here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious if you noticed who the conditional NDCs were most dependent on, like which countries were people saying, oh, if they reduce, then we'll reduce. Um, I, I, I can shorten that because in the paper, I don't have a question now right away, in the paper um, uh, we show, um, or we, 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 sh we have an appendix that you can download where we say how these conditional claims are construed. Um, I have to say we don't go now back in my craft. I It was for conditional. Mm -hmm. So you could see if there are, you could see some, for some countries, I think Korea, the case was that the NDC, which was the original, and NDC plus are more or less the same because they say we do anyway so much. For other countries, I would game probably guess Africa. Uh, here you see for Africa, yeah, the, the, um, 
the additional ABC is quite a bit, the, the, the brown bar. So, but the, the story why this is the case and what is the written text, I don't know now, but we have it basically uh, sorted out in the paper with the appendix. Thank you. Yeah. I do have a feeling on that question that the U.S. was one of the ones that needed to act for the other ones to go to their conditional more often than not. I also uh, am reminded um, this study was done during the previous administration here in the U.S., so if you notice the intermediate steps, intermediate coalitions below the two, um, uh, the no trading at all and global trading, there are... Um, Europe and China, uh, inter-Asia uh, trading box, and the U.S. is not in any yeah. coalitions. You know, probably in this administration, you could usefully uh, put the U.S. back in. I think there's some interest in, yeah. in doing that. So uh, maybe one, one addition. Then, um, I actually, one idea of EMF is also that it allows other people, maybe you, to... Uh, not to free ride, but to basically use for public good as well. And we, we, from the exercise, we will prove something like marginal abatement costs across sectors and regions. And this can be downloaded. Um, and then you could do, in a nutshell, similar analysis with a very simple partial equilibrium model on, with mug curves and trading. So if you have steep curves in the high pledge, then you would like to trade with him. And so this, this one issue that we did, uh, that, uh, that, re that, that resonates a little bit um, with my one message is take the trade from, uh, take the gains from trade and turn it into trade climate. So I was out writing a paper saying uh, uh, turning trade from, uh, turning gains from trade into gains from climate. And the idea was simply what I, what I showed take the cost savings and everybody is still fine because they don't have to pay more and use, not recycle it to the individual countries. And, uh, and then my colleague, this is a game theory, he said, well, Chris, you know, this is not flying because why should I give, why should I give away money? And I said, well, maybe it's because, you know, everybody wants, but the way the market determines the efficiency gains from trade is not perceived as fair. Even if you go in a free trade agreement, you may have a much higher gain than him. And then you say, no, no, this is not fair. Uh, I don't do it. And although he could benefit, you know, this is this EC, ERC uh, theory with uh, fairness. Also, that may not be so appealing because it's just an argument. What is much more interesting is that there is a literature out where you say, if you price environmental benefits, then uh, you know, some countries have an incentive actually to rather to, to increase their commitments. Um, so there is, an, if somebody is interested, send me a pay, uh, an email and I can, uh, I can refer to that. So what I put as a, as a, as a proposition that, that countries would go ahead and voluntarily sacrifice their cost savings can be put in a rigorous Nash framework where people do it for their own sake. Uh, it requires two things that you have environmental benefits, willingness to pay that are very different across countries as, as, as we have seen, and some fallback position that cannot be zero. And in our case, the fallback position is that you can't go below the NDCs you had initially. But then the interesting thing was what we showed with the, with the numbers from EMF that in this strategic game where uh, you basically can uh, increase your pledges above NDC, you, you, the, 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 the globe does even more than in the simple gain scenario that I pushed here. So, uh, so it will not be only 20%, but 23 or 24% emission reductions. With that said, we probably have to wrap it up here. Thanks yep. again, Chris, for a great talk and a great wrap up to our uh, series this quarter. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you.